This week on Q&A, filmmaker Ivan Kander and his friend Rob Jones discuss their documentary, Survive, Recover, Live, The Rob Jones Story. Ivan Kander, why did you do a documentary on your wounded buddy from high school? Um, I feel like it kind of came from a natural, like a natural place. Uh, when Rob first got back to Bethesda, um, we were, he just kind of kept on telling me that he wanted to remember everything that was happening. The things were happening so fast. He was going in and out of surgery like every day. And I think from that idea of wanting to remember, I kind of, that natural inclination to uh, make it went from there. And I've always been working in video and we've been making movies together since we were very young. So it just felt like the natural right thing to do. And even if it didn't turn out to be a documentary or you know, even a finished product, at least we would have had footage to kind of, he could remember that time of his life and it kind of all stemmed from there. And Rob Jones, why did you let your buddy do this documentary? I just thought it would be a good opportunity to let people see uh, the process of recovering from something like that. Because I had never seen uh, anything available that covered that topic. When did you start it? Um, I believe we started filming uh, actual footage maybe two or three weeks after uh, Rob was, uh, got back to, to the States. And then we actually physically started doing actually on-camera interviews a couple months after that when he was actually uh, not going into surgery every day and it wasn't as hectic of a recovery process. What are the extent of your in injuries? Um, <clears throat> I have a left knee disarticulation on my left ear and uh, right transfemoral amputation. Is that it now? I mean, how yeah, many... Yeah, that's all. How many... Is it, yeah, <laughs> is that, that's enough. How many different operations did you have to have to get to where you are today? Um, it was... Uh, I don't remember the exact number, but it was pretty much every other day for two or three weeks and then one more and then I had uh, two surgeries where they replaced my eardrums that had gotten ruptured. Now you are a graduate of Virginia Tech University. Correct. At what point in your university time did you go into the Marine Corps and why did you go enlisted? Uh, it was after my junior year and I went enlisted. My original plan was to uh, join the reserves after my junior year finish college and then uh, go to OCS. But then I just decided to go to Iraq instead and I kind of liked being enlisted and then I got back from Iraq and went straight to Afghanistan. Uh, Ivan Kander, we're going to run the entire documentary in this hour program and it's, uh, it's about 25 minutes plus the credits on the end. Mm -hmm. How did you shoot it and how many hours did you shoot? Um, I obviously have a lot more footage that I ended up using. I think I probably about 15 to 20 hours of footage that was boiled down to the 24 minutes. I knew that I had to keep it relatively brief and I've actually never made a, a short movie over 15 minutes before so I, it was my goal not to do anything too long and keep the story concise. Um, as an editor I like to keep things in a, a very coherent short package usually. Where'd you get the title and, and what is the title? The title is Survive, Recover, Live and that's straight from Rob actually. Um, he said that almost, I forget exactly when you said it, um, I believe it was a uh, I feel like it was a couple weeks after uh, you got back to Bethesda. It was very soon after he was injured, and that kind of became his philosophy. And I was like, well, that's, that's your title right there. And when did you think of Survivor, Recover, Live? Uh, it was probably a couple weeks after I was wounded. I remember I put it on Facebook, so <laughs> I, had, uh, I had Internet access at the time. So it was probably two weeks or something after I got wounded. A lot of the story is set up and told in the first 11 minutes, which is the survive part of this. Mm -hmm. And we'll, we're going to run the whole 11 minutes, and then we'll come back and have you guys fill in the blanks. Okay, that sounds great. Hello and welcome to the first annual Monopoly Championship. I'm Chet Chetberg. And I'm Dick Williams. How are you doing today, Dick? I'm doing very well. All right, we have an exciting matchup today between Rob and Ivan. It's going to be a hellraiser. Okay, let's pause this right here. This is a story about my friend Rob. That's me and him in high school. You see, I'm the cliché, the nerdy kid who watched Jurassic Park way too many times as a kid and had the ill-conceived idea that he could suddenly be the next Spielberg. And with all my bad writing and grainy, shaky camera work, Rob was there, every time, supporting me. You see, like I said, this story isn't about me, 
it's about him. Once we graduated, I figured that we would be famous, making amazing films for all to see. We would be unstoppable. Times change. Hey, how you doing? It's great to be here tonight. He just had a great character about him, just a great personality. Rob was one of those guys that just stood out to all of us and just had a just, just explosive personality. He's goofy. He's outgoing as all. I've never met anybody quite as outgoing as him. He's got these quirks about him that are just very consistent. Everything, everything had 100% in it. He brought such like a, a charisma to the whole unit. He was always up at 8 a.m., you know, always like ready, never missed breakfast. Everyone's dead tired, he never missed breakfast. He's a great guy. He's just real fun and down to earth, really. And like a group of people, everyone sort of looks towards him like for the, the fun and the party. He's always like constantly like working out and always like pushing everybody that he's around to be be better. He never got mad, you know, he never got pissed, he never, he always volunteered to do stuff and uh, everyone kind of looked at him and was like, where do you get this energy from? Where do you get this optimism from? Recently had some elections, uh, Republicans took back the House of Representatives, but uh, you know, we're still seeing a lot of election stickers around even though the election's over. These uh, stickers seem to stick around for a long time. I could have sworn the other day I saw Vote Washington, 1776. <laughs> that was it July 22nd of 2010. We were at Fob Rinkerman in the Sangin district of Afghanistan in Helmand province. So I was with a squad and I was basically clearing a path for them and I stepped on or I got hit by an IED, I'm not sure what kind it was. The first thing, you hear the boom, you see the flash and everything, and then the next thing you hear is you hear him cry out in pain. The second thing I heard him is, you know, if I've lost anything special, um, you know, shoot me. And then the guys tell him he hasn't lost his, uh, his uh, private parts, and, uh, and then bam, he's good. I was pretty much right on top of it and it took my left leg and my right leg. I collected his uh, leg and I thought he had lost a whole lot more because when, when I picked up his leg, you know, in, in my mind's eye, I'm seeing his knee down. And of course, I, I probably was looking at upper shin down. Sometimes I feel like I probably should have seen it or sometimes I feel like maybe I rushed myself and I should have seen, you know, an indicator or something. He was coherent. I, I mean, he had morphine in his system. The company commander came up to us and he told us that two of our guys had gotten hit. Um, one of them's name was Jones, and then we came to find out later that the other one's name was Jones. And we didn't know which one was uh, hit and how bad e either of them were. We heard pretty bad stories. The reports originally came back that Jones RR was a double amputee which usually, you know, is assumed to be legs. And then it was reported that Jones DD was a triple amputee. And then there's a lot of mix up because they both are last name Jones from the same unit. We were in Sangin, Afghanistan, and we were waiting to cross a river. They called for seven volunteers to go out there, and I was one of the ones who went out there, and we were just, we we're setting up in a tree line and just to keep eyes on, and uh, that's when I got hit. We thought it was a mortar that had that they were shooting at us. So uh, we just started walking back quicker. And then uh, right as we got to uh, about 25 meters from our truck, they started pulling stretchers out. I don't really know much else about it. I haven't really gone through the necessary paperwork to find out the details, but I got blown up and that's all I really need to know, I guess. I didn't even recognize him at first. You know, the mud and dirt, blood all over his face. It wasn't until like five, 10 minutes later, we realized that it was actually Dan. Rob and Daniel are both really athletic, really into working out, like Jim Jones. They would both go to the gym together, and so they would call themselves Jim Jones. And uh, 
I mean, grueling workouts. I met them and it was like kind of like a package deal. Very good friends. They uh, inseparable at times. If you're if you're getting made fun of by one of them, then they just sit there and, and you know feed off each other and make it and just escalate it, escalate it, escalate it. One thing about Dee Dee and Rob is they're both always reading books, always interested in learning new things. You know, that's outside their scope of stuff that they're used to. So when we were in ICU, we were almost right across the hall from each other. I think that's really when it it hit me that it, he had actually been hurt. Hey bud, I'm still down here in intensive care. Just wanted to say hi. Love you. Miss you. I can't wait to get up to the fifth floor and hang out. It'll be good times. We'll work on a fucking workout plan. Take care, buddy. I'll see you soon. Bye. Three. Go ahead. You gotta hold it closer. Alright, alright. Because I don't have a good that's, voice. That's, he could hear you. Hey man, uh, first things first, we gotta design a, a workout program to get on our feet again. <laughs> And then, we're gonna have a really good time up here. I can't wait to see you, and uh, I'm thinking about you. Peace. If there's any good that came out of it, it, it was the fact that, you know, yeah, it was nice to have someone there, you know, that was going through something like you were so you could talk. I think it made me stronger, because I had to be tougher, because he was there. When he would come in my room and stuff, that always made me feel better. There was, uh, recently there was a tornado unfortunately in the Midwest and actually ended up killing eight people um, but luckily the tornado was apprehended by police um, and it was sentenced to eight consecutive life sentences in the stratosphere with no chance of water vapor so it was a good ending to that story. I joined the Marine Corps in 2006 on my junior year of college at Virginia Tech and then I went back and finished my last year because I was a reservist. My job as a combat engineer is to find IEDs in any, in any situation. Our job was, you know, looking for explosives and blowing them up. And so it's Rob, me, a couple guys, and, and we're out there and, and we find some, some weapon caches and there's tons of stuff. We're digging up stuff all day, you know, exhausted, you know, don't get any sleep that night. You know, a couple, third day goes by and, and we're just like done. I don't want to see a shovel. I don't want to pick up another 100 pound munition. You know, I'm tired. I want to go home and get some chow and get some water. I'm dirty. I haven't showered. And Rob was the only one that was like, no, let's keep looking. There's more. There's, you know, let's, and he just, you know, everyone you know, is like, let's, let's take a break. And he was like, grab the shovel, grab, you know, his rifle, grab his gear. And I'm going out looking for more, you know. And he found more stuff. And he, he always had that personality just to, keep driving, keep pushing in, in such an optimistic way, you know, he never got down about anything. And he, he really kind of, you know, inspired the whole unit with his personality. He was the reason why I made it back. If there was anybody that was diligent and followed the procedures, went step by step, and never sped it up, that was him. We still don't know exactly what it was that he had stepped on, but there's no doubt in my mind that it was one of the hardest IEDs that could be found, if found at all. When I thought of joining the military, I didn't want to join anything but the Marine Corps. I was just taken in by the camaraderie and pretty much everything that the Marine Corps stood for. Well, I guess I kind of always wanted to be a Marine. I'm not exactly sure why. The main thing that attracted me to the Marines was just the brotherhood. I think I wanted to join because I wanted to build up something. I wanted to go fight. And, and there's this saying, you know, uh, a true soldier doesn't, uh, doesn't fight for what he hates in front of him but because of what he loves that he left behind. And he meets so many great guys and, and you know, Rob really personified that more than anyone I've ever known. The people that I was over there with, I mean, you, you just become so close with them and every second of every day is is with them. So you have no choice but to, to bond with them and, and get along, but then you come back here and it, it's just so much easier to have someone that's gone through the, the same type of things as, uh, as, as you went through. I just felt like as long as there were Marines somewhere, fighting that I should be over there with them because I didn't join the Marine Corps to just stay in the States. I joined the Marine Corps to do the fighting. And I really like the aspects of the Brotherhood of the Marine Corps. That's been really prominent in the friendships that I've made uh, in the Marine Corps with other Marines is that I know that I can always depend on them and they can depend on me. Like I would hop out of this wheelchair in a second if I had to for a buddy, you know, if they got in a fight or something and vault out. I don't know how I do it, but somehow I'm really close to the people I went to Iraq with just because we spent so much time together and we went through all these different experiences together. That's also what Corporal Jones showed me, is that, you know, 
We were the family and we were continuing all of this. We got the phone calls from our friends saying, hey, got some bad news, you know, Rob got hurt. We all took off work, we drove down to Bethesda, we, we met up with his family. Immediately though, you know, even though he was drugged up on morphine, kind of out of it, you could still see he had the his same personality, he was still with it, he was still joking around. For being as drugged up as he was, he was, you know, still Jones. That was kind of the first time we thought to ourselves, you know, thank God he's, he's all right, he's still the same guy. Ivan Kander, where were you when you first heard that Rob Jones had been injured? Um, I was uh, right here locally. I, I live in Silver Spring, and I received the call from a friend of ours, a mutual friend of ours, to let me know that Rob was injured. Um, and the odd thing about that call is, obviously, I was very sad to hear that my friend was injured, but at the same time, it was almost a sense of relief that he was still alive, because that was one thing that was very clear about that 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 interaction was that Rob was still alive. He was injured, but he was still alive, which was, you know, um, I was very, very happy to hear that. When did you play this documentary for your students and friends in Loudoun County, which is right out here in the suburbs? Uh, we played it <clears throat> on the one year anniversary of when I was wounded, uh, July 22nd of this year. And what was the crowd like and what was your reaction to having to go through that in public? Uh, the crowd was primarily people that I knew, but there were a lot of people that I didn't really, I'd never met before. Um, they were very supportive. You know, that when I came in, they uh, clapped for me and everything. Um, the mayor of the town gave me a plaque that said they they uh, made that Rob Jones Day. Um, I got a quilt. And I, I don't know, I've never really been shy about being, doing things in public, so it didn't really bother me. When did you two first meet? Um, it's hard to say exactly when we first met. I believe it was in middle school, right, Rob? I think eighth grade, home yeah, Maybe, yeah, it was around, because around eighth grade, they start pairing you by last names, and he was always the last J in the alphabet, and I was always the first K in the alphabet, so we started having, we always had to start the day together, and from then on, it just became really good friends. So it was definitely in middle school sometime. How much did it cost you to make this? Uh, uh, it really didn't cost me very, pretty much nothing, um, because I already own my own equipment anyway. Um, and anything that I had to uh, rent, uh, my uh, my employer was very good to let, uh, let me rent, uh, take it free of charge. And where it, are you working now? I work for Booz Allen Hamilton, the consulting company. And why did you agree to go along and do this in the first place? What was the, what do you want to accomplish with this being public? Uh, the show? Not this show, but your I'm whole the documentary. documentary. Uh, yeah. I just wanted people to see what uh, what people go through after they're wounded. Uh, in Afghanistan, and uh, you know, if if I happen to inspire anybody by doing the documentary to, uh, you know, just uh, try as hard as they can to recover as well as I have, uh, then that's a that's a bonus. Let's go over the details again on your service. When did you go in the Marine Corps? For, what was the first day? My first day at boot camp was. May 17th of 2006. How long did you serve? Uh, well, technically I'm still in, uh, uh, waiting for my medical medical board to finish. But it's been about uh, five years and some change. And you went to Iraq, and what year did you do? Uh, you were there seven, six, seven months? Uh, seven months, and we went from January of 2008 to August 2008. And you were a corporal? Uh, at the for the Iraq deployment, I was the lance corporal, and for the Afghanistan deployment, I what was what does the that corporal. mean? And, and if, for those who've never been in the service, where does a lance corporal fit on the? Uh, it's just a rank. Um, there are nine enlisted ranks that you can be. Uh, lance corporal is the third one. Corporal is the fourth one. And what was your assignment in Iraq? Iraq, I was just a, a team member uh, in a fire team. That's four people, um, and we just supported an infantry unit. How close did you come in Iraq being wounded or stepping on an IED or getting <clears throat> some kind of a, uh, a combat situation? Um, there wasn't really a whole lot going on in the part of Iraq that we were in. Um, I guess the most dangerous thing I did was handle you know, munitions that had been buried in the ground. Uh, I guess they could have been booby trapped, but we didn't really have any, believe, any reason to believe that they were. Uh, I think there was one one IED hit that ended in casualties in the battalion. 
Um, there was only one time that I was around any shooting, and I, it was in front of me. Ivan Kender, how hard was it to find all those fellows that you uh, talked to? Um, luckily, I got Rob to coordinate everything for me in the sense that these are good friends of his, so they were willing to come out and support him. And getting them together uh, became a process of him just giving them a call and saying, hey, you need to come down here. We really want to get you on camera. And they were more than willing, which is fantastic. How many of them are still in the service? Um, I believe uh, most of them are. I know Will isn't anymore. No, uh, Urego um, isn't. Uh, Diablo isn't. Everybody else is. So maybe two, two of the people that are no longer in the service. I noticed when you shot the other f uh, uh, Jones, Dan, mm -hmm. uh, Dan Jones, that we only saw his head. We didn't see what what uh, limbs he had lost. What did he lose? That's the interesting thing about the whole thing, and I probably should have shown this in the in the film itself, but he actually ended up not losing any limbs. He, um, he was believed to be a triple amputee at the first reports, and that's why there was so much confusion, and then it came out that he, uh, he still has all his limbs. He has limited mobility in his uh, one of his legs. I believe his arm, but he still has all his limbs. And the reason he's where everyone's like, why is he wearing sunglasses? I think he was just shy and he didn't want to be on camera. It was bright out that day. And too. it was also very bright out that day. Yeah. What's been the toughest part of this for you? Uh, Not the documentary, but the right, injury right, and the recovery. recovery. Probably the hardest part is probably having to let people help me do stuff. Uh, you say that in the documentary. Yeah. And why is that so hard? I don't know. I've always just been really independent, and I like to do things myself. And, uh, you know, having to let people, like, move boxes for me when I, you know, used to be able to do it myself is kind of, of hard to accept. But uh, no, I've, uh, I've started to get used to it at this point. Had you ever thought about going in the service? Uh, no, I've never thought about it, yeah. My, uh, my heart's in video, so that's what I want to do. Yeah. And... When you go back to the, when you were at Virginia Tech, and you always, I think you alluded to this, you always thought you'd go into the service at some point. Where does that come from in your life? I hadn't really thought about it until, um, until my sophomore year, really. I, I, was, uh, I started as a computer science major, and I decided I didn't really want to do that for a career, so I was kind of, you know, just brainstorming about stuff that I could do. And my f a friend of mine had just uh, had just joined, um, so I kind of started reading books about the Marine Corps to see what you know uh, what he was getting himself into, you know. And I kind of liked what I was reading. So, I what is it thing. though? What is it about it that you liked? Um, mostly the the brotherhood, like I said in the documentary. Uh, it just seems like Marines are just extra close to each other, and they always strive to be better and just be the best they can. And just being around that kind of person um, brings the best out of me as well. I think there was only one officer that I saw in there. Uh, yeah. In, how many of the other enlisted Marines had college experience? Um, let me think. Pretty much all of them have some college experience. Did uh, you I all think. talk much about why they had gotten into the service also? Not really. Uh, I think we all pretty much just kind of assumed we had generally the same reasons. And as you were shooting this, did you run into any problems of people saying you can't bring that camera in here? Uh, <laughs> uh, not, not a lot. There were a couple instances just when he was doing some uh, recovery and physical therapy, just you know, bringing a camera into a public place. We ran into some issues there, but it wasn't. There was nothing crazy or difficult, especially because I think that the topic of this documentary, a lot of people are really open to allowing you to 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 record for that kind of thing, because it you know it's such an interesting story and it's about uh, a veteran of this country. Yeah. The, the next segment is called Recover. Yes. What's this about? Um, basically, like you know, self-explanatory. I, I kind of wanted to, based on what Rob's initial statement, survive, recover, live. You know, each kind of represents a different stage of that process. And recover is now that he is back, and uh, you know, he's gone through the initial surgeries. You know, how he's starting to develop and uh, get back to uh, basically a routine or a schedule. Uh, before we run, I, did, I don't see his parents. They don't talk in this. Um, 
for a couple a couple reasons. Uh, one, uh, when I asked to interview his parents, um, they asked me not to include them because uh, it was too soon after the accident. She didn't think she'd be appropriate to be on camera, so I respected her wishes and didn't uh, record her on camera. Does he have other brothers and sisters? That he you... he does have a brother and a, a sister. Uh, his sister lives pretty far away, so she's hard to get in touch with. And uh, I, the brother didn't want to be on camera, I believe, for similar reasons. Okay, well, let's, this is eight minutes and 34 seconds, the second part of a three-part documentary. It was really bad at first. I couldn't sleep at all because I had nightmares constantly whenever I closed my eyes. A normal person, when they close their eyes, it gets dark. But for me, it would be like... Uh, It'd be like I was watching a movie, and the movie was either some weird hallucination or some kind of a nightmare. For a split second, I would relive the blast, and I, would, I, could, see, I could see my legs like splattered all over the ground. Sometimes I would hallucinate really bad stuff, like I, was, like I would be going out on patrol, and I got shot, so the patrol was going out with me without me and I was stuck back at the fob. And another time I dreamed that I got hit by a mortar and for some reason my mom was with me and it just really hurt and I could see like blood all over the place. So those were really the worst times. He was laying down in his bed and we were standing up around him just trying to talk with them and he was in and out of it, really drugged up. There was like maybe five guys here and he's telling us about what he's seeing and the morphine kind of making him, you know, visualize a couple things. And he's like, yeah, he's like, I just, I'm fighting off these aliens right now. They're just walking around and now they're zombies. And, and he looks up and he sees, he looks at me and my friends. He's like, oh, you're Rego, great. You guys are here too. He's like, well, uh, uh oh, you're, you're falling through the ground. You're, you guys are sinking through the mud. And he's like, bye guys, bye. Good luck with that. And then you, you get quiet for a minute. And you come back, he's like, I just got back from Japan, you know. <laughs> so he, he still had a good sense of humor. I wanted to get a, a funny hat for my mom uh, because I thought that if I was wearing a funny hat the first time she saw me, it would take the edge off a little bit, you know. She would see, you know, my legs and she would see the funny hat and she wouldn't be able to help but laugh and put herself in a good mood. But uh, they weren't able to find one. And when I got to Bethesda, there's my mom with a pirate hat in her hand. So somehow they found out that I asked for a funny hat and she brought me one. It's really hard to accept at first, but you know, it's, you take what caused you to be like that and you realize, you know, it's kind of understandable that you know, you have to get so much help. So the first thing they did was close my left leg. I had some serious wounds to my rear end, which were still open. They were really deep. So I would go into surgery pretty much every other day. They closed up all my wounds, and then we waited five days to make sure the skin graft took. And then they checked the skin graft, they saw it was good. The next day I got transferred to Walter Reed because that's the place you go for prosthetics. You get these little things called stubbies and they're, they're about this, this tall. They're just straight bars. And you're on those for a while because obviously you're, you're relearning how to walk. So you wanna keep your center, center of gravity low. And then they heighten you a little bit and it's still the straight, the straight bar. They change the foot that's on it they change it to a foot that flexes, so it's like you have an ankle almost. And then after you've mastered that, you graduate to the full height, then you have some, You have a knee. The first type of leg you learn is the C leg, which is a computerized leg, and it has sensors for pressure. And then after you've mastered the C leg, you get a mechanical leg, which works on your own power. And after that, you just come in until you're ready to get discharged. Now, there's a difference between phantom sensation and then there's phantom pain. Phantom sensation is when you just feel your limbs that aren't there anymore. Uh, and phantom pain is when they actually hurt. Your brain's confused, like, it thinks that your limbs are still there, but they're not, and your synapses, like, misfire and stuff. And that's why you feel it. You know how sometimes when you go to sleep and you accidentally go like this with your arm, and it ends up flopping down and you can't feel it? 
It's like uh, imagine trying to move your fingers like that. You can uh, you can imagine that your arm is there and that your fingers are there and you're trying to move them but they won't move no matter how hard you try. The whole thing hasn't really been all that difficult. I'm kind of just going through it, you know. He would have humor at all times. I mean, if if a guy can laugh when his legs are blown off, you know, there's something special about him. When he found out they had Mountain Dew over in Iraq, he was ecstatic. You know, so that theme sort of stays with him. And even up when the president gave him his Purple Heart in Bethesda, he asked President Barack Obama to do the do with him. When we were in Musa Kela the first time with Weapons Company and uh, Kilo Company, we were all out in the middle of nowhere. We, we didn't have a whole lot of food and stuff, and everybody was getting sick. You could really couldn't go five minutes in the one compound with, without somebody, without hearing like, Bleh! And I remember Rob was so happy because he hadn't gotten sick yet, and his whole platoon he was with. And I saw him the next day, and he just looked like crap. But he was so proud they hadn't puked yet. I didn't get, I didn't puke though. I am very proud of that fact. I hate having to have people take care of me and stuff. I like to be the one that's taking care of other people instead. It's okay. a real pleasure to meet you, man. It's a pleasure to meet you. What happened? Uh, IED. Yeah. I'm, I'm a combat engineer, so it's my job to find them. And uh, I was just, I was looking for one at the time. And, you know, I found it, but <laughs> found it in the worst way possible blew up on me, so. But I talked to my physical therapist and I told her uh, the Marine Corps birthday is November 10th and I want to be walking by then. And I told her I'd do whatever I had to do. I'd come down two, three times a day. You know, I did whatever she said I had to do in order to be walking by November 10th. His goal was, was getting to you know, the Marine Corps ball in November and being able to stand up and dance and do this whole scene where he goes up in his wheelchair and he like, you know, stands up and starts walking. He, he talked about that every day and he did it. You know, that was amazing to see that in such a short amount of time. There's like the therapy world, which is where I am now. Then there's the, the real world. And the therapy world is very flat, and everybody knows the plight that you're in, so they can kind of lend a hand when you need it. But then there's the real world where there's all sorts of hills that I have to go up and down. Uh, there isn't always a railing when I need one. I have to get a specially adapted car. That's become more obvious to me now versus, you know, before when I didn't have any kind of disability. Somehow I knew that I would survive. Instead, I pictured the rest of my life without legs and realized that I would have to give up some of the plans I had made and some of the things I loved doing. Somehow, despite all this, I managed to maintain a positive attitude. And now that I have seen and heard about the amazing things that prosthetics can accomplish, I know that I do not actually have to give up on those plans. Thank you for having me here today, and I hope you have a wonderful Veterans Day. Thank you. All right, let's get serious. So a couple quick questions, Ivan Kander. Uh, did he really have an audience when he was doing that humor? No, no, that's all just a, a, a mock audience, yeah. Did you script it or did he write the, those uh, All jokes? the jokes are totally Rob's. The concept of you know shooting him in front of a fake audience was my idea, but that's all Rob is all that stuff, so yeah. Go back to uh, Afghanistan where you were uh, injured, wounded. July 22nd, 2010, you know, we're a little bit more than a year later. How, since then, how many days have you spent in a hospital? As an inpatient? Probably about two months total. What time of day were you, uh, did you step on the IED? Uh, I think it was early afternoon. I'm not positive though, it was pretty hot. So I think it was early afternoon. 
had you had any friends there in the, that you had seen this happen to before? Um, nothing that serious. My friend, uh, a couple days before, I got hit in the cheek by uh, a piece of shrapnel from an RPG, but he was fine. Um, and other people got hit by IEDs while they were in trucks, and they got uh, just shaken up a little bit, but nobody had actually uh, been wounded this badly. And do I understand that you were looking for IEDs? Yeah, I was looking for one. And how how is it that you, I mean, what kind of devices do you use to avoid them, and how is it that you hit this one? Well, when you're on foot, uh, you kind of use intuition and uh, eyeballs. Um, and then I also have a metal detector. So I just kind of, uh, what happened on that day was somebody had stepped on uh, except on a, a separate one because they like to plant two right next to each other and his didn't go off like it was supposed to it just uh I think it just hit the, the blasting cap went off and that's a very tiny it's like a firecracker almost um, so that let us know that that was an area where we were in danger but it wasn't one of the classic areas where you would expect to see an IED because uh, we weren't being funneled by any terrain or we weren't being funneled by anything. So I think it was just some kind of a random placement. They just were hoping they'd get lucky and hit somebody. Um, What's the first thing they do when you're uh, injured like that? What, what I mean, talking about the morphine and all that, when do, you, when do they give you that morphine? Um, well, the first thing they need to be concerned with is making sure that the path from me to them is clear of IEDs um, and any other kind of danger because they don't want people to keep running up to me and uh, stepping on more and more because that's what the Taliban likes to do. They like to, because they know that we're going to run over there, so they plant one here and then this person gets hit and they plant another one here so the people coming to help them get hit too. Um, so the first thing they do is make sure that that's clear and then... I mean, once the the only people that have morphine are the corpsmen. So once the corpsman got there, he hit me in the in the leg with some morphine. And from that moment till the time you got back to Bethesda Naval Hospital, where did you go? Um, I think at first I went to Camp Leatherneck, and then that's in Afghanistan. And then I think I went to Bagram Air Force Base in Afghanistan, and then I think from there I went to um, Germany. And then from Germany, I went to Bethesda. How has your friend changed since all this happened? I think the most amazing thing is the fact that he hasn't changed, at least in personality-wise. You hear so many stories about post-traumatic stress disorder and, uh, and them not being the same person that they once were, but Rob's the same person I've known since middle school, which I, I think is fantastic because at the end of all this, I still have my friend, which is, I think, the most important thing to me. What have you noticed about your other friend's reaction around... Rob I mean, Jones. It, it, everyone's been really amazing. I think that Rob, once you meet him, he breaks the ice very quickly. So it's, it's very easy to forget that he w uh, looks any different or has to move any differently. And a lot of our friends are still joint friends. So, you know, it's not going to be a big difference if we, you know, hang out with people that we always hung out with before. When we do that again, it's, it's going to be very much the same camaraderie. When you started out to do your documentary, did you have a script? Um, the only thing I scripted really uh, was the uh, opening and closing voiceover, and that didn't happen uh, until I had some footage to go with. At first, I was just sh shooting random stuff, and then I let the story develop from there. And what was your reason for doing this? Um, main, I, I, really, it was just kind of, I felt like it was something that I should do. And I say that in the sense that here was my friend who was presenting a very compelling story, and as a storyteller my entire life, it would feel wrong not to tell that story. Do you personally have any attitude uh, about this war? The one thing that I was really intent about this documentary is to not make it about anything political or about the war whatsoever. I feel like there are amazing documentaries out there that cover that very topic, and I don't think that a personal story about my friend would hold the same weight as those. So my goal is strictly to keep it about Rob. Now, you're still in the service, mm -hmm. and you're waiting. Do you have a job? My job right now is to recover. D did you do your internship we, we, I think I don't remember where we talked about in this with the FBI yet. Yeah, I've been going in for uh, six weeks, I think something something in there. I go in on Fridays right now because uh, I'm still going into physical therapy um, for most of my time. And what are you waiting for between now and whenever you're? Are you gonna? 
leave the uh, Marine Corps? Uh, yeah, I'm probably going to uh, retire. But uh, right now I'm just waiting for the Physical Evaluation Board to deliver my, uh, my percentage of disability, and then I'll sign some more paperwork, and that'll be it. What's your overall feeling about the treatment you've gotten? The treatment I've gotten has been top-notch uh, from the very first day. The surgeons taking care of me there, uh, the nurses were great, um, and then the physical therapy has been uh, unbelievable, and the prosthetics care that I've gotten has just been all just so good. I can't say enough good things about it. Now, do you have other prosthetics besides what you're wearing today? Uh, yeah, I have... I have um, legs that I use to ride a bike. I have legs that I use to um, to walk around in my my room. They're short. Uh, I have legs that I'm going to try and use for rowing. Um, I have running legs, and then I have a couple other sets of uh, knees that I've that I've tried uh, before. And how much have you gotten used to this? Yeah, um, uh, pretty much, probably about as much as you can. And how much are there computers in your legs? Yeah, these particular legs have microprocessors in them. And what is the what's the service's attitude about the future? Will I mean, will for instance, will you be supplied legs for the rest of your life? Uh, I'm not positive about how that works, but I I'm pretty sure that the VA will give me. Uh, new legs and new sockets whenever I need them. Um, I haven't really looked into how it, everything works, like what I'm going to have to do, but uh, I'm pretty sure that's, that's how it works. The last segment of uh, the documentary is live. What was your, what was your approach here? Um, I think that oftentimes in stories, when you hear about people uh, injured in combat and coming back, you know, the initial focus is on that initial uh, survival and recovery stage. So I did want to show a point uh, showing that Rob was actually living a really pretty interesting life and doing a lot of really interesting things. And the fact that recovery is not strictly that first two months or month after you've been injured, it, it goes beyond that for the rest of your life. Did he ever say to you after you taped something, uh, uh, you can't put that in there? No, never. Uh, actually, he's never said that to me. Uh, in fact, he gave me full creative freedom to do pretty much whatever I wanted, which is pretty amazing. Did that surprise you? Uh, I think that he knows me well enough that uh, he, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't do anything that would either represent him poorly or incorrectly. So, yeah. This segment is, let's see, it's five minutes and 57 seconds long, and it's the last of the three different uh, sections. I really think it's his positive attitude, his positive outlook on everything. He realizes you can't go back and change it, so make the best of it. When he first got in his wheelchair, he started learning to do tricks on him, like spinning around and things like that. He's one of those people you could sit there and you could say caring and nice and passionate and all this other stuff that you say about normal people, but I think everybody knows he's not normal. He's, you know, he's better than that. He's incredible. His dreams may have just changed a little bit, but he's still going for it. I mean, he's just a cool dude. Since I left Walter Reed inpatient, I moved out to what's called the Malone House, the outpatient housing for all the outpatients that they have here. Basically, I've just been going through the normal progression of the prosthetics. I've pretty much returned to as much a sense of normalcy as I was before but I don't think I'll be completely normal until I get out of the hospital, I get a job, and you know, I kind of put all this behind me. I have a, an internship with the FBI in the works. Once I get discharged, hopefully they'll make me a job offer, and ideally I will be able to become a special agent after getting myself in shape for the physical fitness test. Still taking it to the bad guys even though I don't have any legs anymore. Near the end of the year, I am planning to attempt a cross-country bike trip, so hopefully I'll be able to do that. And I would like to get into uh, maybe some kind of a, a Paralympic sport, like rowing. I'm, I'm kind of looking at rowing, maybe the biathlon.
had to start with the baseline of having a great attitude and having a solid, just having a solid attitude to, to start from. But now that all my friends and all my family have seen me with that great attitude, I can't do anything. I can't change that because it'll let them down. And every time I ever start to feel, you know, start to feel down about my situation or start to feel sorry for myself, I remember that I have to maintain this, this attitude. So it's really them forcing me to stay positive rather than me just coming up with some kind of inner strength to, uh, to stay positive throughout the whole process. I recently uh, put in an application for, for a social security disability. Got denied. Yeah, that makes sense. <laughs> Learned a lot about myself, a lot about perseverance. You have to keep going whether or not uh, your circumstances are uh, ideal. It's uh, just the way things are, so you just kind of got to go with it, you know? He's never going to give up, and he's going to be successful no matter what you take away from him or throw at him. You know, he's going to keep on driving. Yeah, everyone's like, oh, he's so strong, blah, 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 blah. I was like, yeah, that's just Jones. He just doesn't let stuff get to him. Obviously, this has changed a lot of things for him, but he's not letting this stop him from doing things he wants to do. He kind of hits a wall and will go and climb over it. He, like I said, if Rob wants to do something, he'll do it. No matter how much it affects him, he doesn't show it at all. His willpower is just amazing. You know, obviously, it really sucks that I lost my legs, you know. Uh, that's something I'm never gonna have back and my life's gonna be different uh, from here on out. So, you know, that really sucks. But, uh, you know, I can't dwell on that too much because there's nothing I can do to change it now. What amazes me most about Rob is what he represents. That in the wake of something awful, the only thing you really can do is keep on going. It's not some momentous thing of courage that occurs in a movie's third act, backed with swelling strings and a vibrant horn section. Really, it's just existing. It's accepting. Shortly after Rob got his senses back and he started the recovery process in Bethesda, he said it all very succinctly. Survive. Recover. Live. Nothing to see here. Time to move on. Time to keep going. It is often said that hindsight is 2020. The only way you can really understand life is by looking at it backwards. But I have to argue that really, Life is understood both ways, both forward and backward. Without the surprises and the unexpected, the good and bad, life lacks flavor. It lacks heart. For if you know how your journey is going to end, if you know the punchline of the joke, really, there's no reason to laugh. Thanks for laughing at my jokes. Have a good night. I better make sure before this closes that you really aren't being denied Social Security in this process, are you? Um, <clears throat> was that a joke or were you serious? Uh, I was denied Social Security benefits. Um, but, I mean, I could have kept... Uh, could have kept appealing probably and they probably would have eventually accepted. I know other people have been accepted that have similar injuries or, you know, uh, less severe injuries, but honestly, I don't really care about it. I only applied for it because they told me I should. And, and what was the reason they gave you that uh, you were denied? I don't remember the exact wording, but I think they, it was something like they expected me to be able to work within 12 months or something. I'm not, I'm not, I don't remember exactly what they said. I just read it, said deny, and I was like, whatever, I don't care. So what do you expect from the Marine Corps once you get out for the rest of your life? Will there be, I assume there's some kind of a stipend for the rest of your life? Yeah, I'll get um, all the, uh, the VA benefits, uh, and uh, I'll be getting disability for... Uh, for forever. I'm not sure how, 100%, I'm not sure what that equates to money-wise, but uh, I'll get that. And, 
you know, the, the Marine Corps and the government both do a good job of taking care of us after, after this happens. Ivan Kander, on the documentary side of this, if someone wants to see the whole documentary, how can they do that? There are a couple of avenues. They can go to my website, which is lucky9studios.com. That's lucky, the number nine, and then studios.com. And there's a link right there on the page to watch it. You can also go to Vimeo, V-I-M-E-O.com, and search for Survive, Recover, Live, and it will, it will appear. What's Lucky Nine? studios stand for? Uh, back when I was about 14, I decided I needed to make a production company for all these short films I was making, and that uh, became the name, and it stuck all the way since, even, even into my current professional career, uh, strictly because nine has always been and always will be my lucky number, so that's the name. English. And your education, where did you get your college degree? Um, I graduated from George Washington University in 2007. This documentary was shot with what kind of a camera and edited on what kind of a machine? Um, I, sh uh, I shot it all on my personal camera, which is a Panasonic prosumer camcorder, um, and uh, it was all edited on my home computer uh, in Final Cut Pro. And how do you feel about the end product you got? Um, I'm really happy with the way it turned out, um, and I'm really proud of the fact that I think it tell I think it showcases who Rob is very well, and I think that uh, just if you hang out with Rob for 15 minutes and watch the documentary, it's not painting a picture of someone that he isn't. He is that person that you see. So when did you hit bottom? Hit bottom? After your injury, in the hospital somewhere along the way, where you did you? dip down and have a have a period of depression uh not really every now and then maybe uh get a little dejected for for like a day you know just like kind of have a bad day kind of bummed but uh not for any significant period of time who of your friends or your family had the toughest time seeing you when you got back oh i'm sure it was probably my mom and my parents and how are they yeah. doing now they seem to be doing fine. Uh, they seem to be handling it pretty well. After your, what are the chances you're going to get this job at the FBI? Do you know yet? Uh, that uh, I guess that's going to depend on a lot of things. Uh, how well I perform in the internship, uh, whether or not they'll even be hiring at the time that I'm uh, that I'm finished. Uh, you know whether they have any openings uh, in the place that I want to go. That kind of stuff. And at this stage in your recovery, how much therapy do you have on a weekly basis? Uh, I do therapy, now that I'm doing the internship, I do it four days a week. Um, I usually go in around 8 o'clock or 9 o'clock and I stay until uh, 1 o'clock or 2 o'clock, like that, like an hour lunch break. And what kind of things do they have you doing now? Uh, most of the stuff that I'm doing right now is related to... Uh, triathlon training and um, rowing training uh, but at first they have you do a lot of uh, strengthening of your core and your hip flexors um, so that you're able to control your your limbs and uh, they do a lot of balance practice and uh, when you first get knees they teach you how to use them and, um, and then you just kind of uh, do harder and harder stuff until you get to a point where you're ready to be done. We're going to run the credits um, on your documentary, and they last about, oh, I think four, four and a half minutes. But as we run them, we'll keep our microphones open, and I'll ask you some, you know, get some quick definitions of the people we see. So why don't we roll those, and uh, we'll wrap this. That's me. <laughs> <laughs> That's you. <laughs> Throughout our whole tour in 2008 in Iraq, he caught everything I ever threw. You know, if you throw in a water bottle to somebody and they catch it, or you know, you're throwing something like you know, just a football around, or you're, you were sitting there prepping the demo, I throw him a stick of C4 over. So I'm sure if he was here today, you know, if I threw this water bottle, you know, he would just kind of, you know, just knowing him and his superhuman abilities, be able to catch this. Ivan Kander, who's that? Um, well, baby, Rob's probably going to be better to explain this. This is one of my two physical therapists. Both of these ladies are my physical therapists. And they're both very nice, nice people when you meet them. Very, very nice people. 
Zach is his uh, prosthetist. How do you say it? Prosthetist. I prosthetist. Think pronounced. Associated with uh, Bethesda Naval. Yeah. He's much. Ralph's much taller than him in that picture. <laughs> <laughs> Who's Mary Jean Solomon? Um, those three names and these two here are uh, nurses and physical therapists at uh, when I was in inpatient at Bethesda. It really goes to show you there's a lot of people that make Rob's recovery possible and the, tr the care he's getting is truly not top notch. Who are these folks? These are people that uh, help me get on the bike and get going on that. Your parents here? Uh, this is my dad and my stepmom. Who is Steve and Carol Miller? Uh, that's my stepdad and my mom. Your mom's there, obviously, on the right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Live yeah. in this area? Um, yes, Virginia. Stevie Miller is? My little brother. How old are you now? I'm 25. And Ivan, your same age? I'm 26. Who's You're Allison? Sister. Jo your sister. Mm -hmm. How old is your sister? She's 29. Probably doesn't like it that we're giving that news away. <laughs> this is our friend Mike. He's been a friend with us since high school, and he actually helped me. Uh, he came with me on a couple shoots to help me out, and he's always been incredibly friendly with both of us. Who's Whitney Robinson? Oh, she's a friend of mine that's just been really supportive. These are all Rob's family, I believe. Yeah, extended family. Extended family that was supportive in that process. And so is Regina as well, right? Yeah, she's my uh, step grandmother. Step grandmother. <laughs> you don't get it. You don't want to get one of those. Uh, I want to. Mrs. Bauer is the one that allowed us to uh, hold the screening at Loudon Valley High School, which is really important because I thought it was a really good venue to show. It's uh, a Loudon Valley High School out here in Loudon County, right Loudon, in the Loudon, suburbs. Exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And this is the uh, Veterans Club in the school that made that possible as well. Um, and then this is uh, Dan Jones's family, and then all the the conglomerate of people that have helped out. The Wounded Warrior Project is the place that. People send money to help out? Correct. And uh, all the proceeds of the screening went to Wounded Warrior yeah, Project. Just in case I ever become famous. That's my money maker, it really is. Yeah, as long as that wasn't in there, we're fine. Yeah, I'm not, <laughs> you didn't mess this up, it's okay. But before my injury, uh, I, like to, uh, I, like to, I like to go to the gym a lot. And uh, has anybody else ever walked into the locker room and gone, hey, oh, woo hoo! <laughs> Put some pants on. And this is all, all the music was donated to me. I didn't have to pay for rights. Uh, and the artist Moby has a, a program called Gratis where he allows young filmmakers to use music for free. Because then I'll be sitting up. Which is pretty cool. I'll be sitting up like this. And I'll lean back like this. I'm like, oh, my legs are stuck. <laughs> <laughs> These are just all my family and friends that have helped me out on the way. Is this the end? And this is the end, yeah. Lucky Nine Studios. Uh, That's the web you're all, yeah. Rob Jones, you were talking earlier about the phantom sensation and the phantom pain. Do you have any of that? Uh, yeah, I still have it. You still it's have it? As, it's not nearly as bad. Uh, I get uh, phantom pain a couple seconds at a time, uh, just a few times a day. It's not really a big deal. And Ivan Kander, are you going to do another documentary? Uh, anything more on Rob Jones? I think at Rob's story is, I mean, his future is so open-ended that there's totally enough material probably to make another film, especially as he starts getting into more Paralympic sports and kind of following that journey of, you know, his interesting starting point and then eventually doing professional uh, sporting events, which I think he's very much capable of. Gentlemen, we're out of time. Thank you very much for, for joining us. Thank you very much Thanks. for having us. Really appreciate it. Thank you. For a DVD copy of this program, call 1-877-662-7726. For free trial, call 1-877-662-7726. Copyright 1927, Lauderdale, Florida, 90210.